Welcome everybody to the 19th Brattleboro Literary Festival. It's my distinct pleasure today to introduce Holly George Warren and Jeff Tamarkin. Holly is the author of Janice, Her Life and Music, a book which is impeccably researched and a joy to read. We know the visible Janice, the one we see dancing on stage, taking a piece of our hearts in the late 60s, but we don't know so much of the introspective vulnerable side. Janice was only 27 when she died 50 years ago this past October 4th. Holly had access to Janice's voluminous correspondence and diaries. She also was able to track down some of Janice's contemporaries for firsthand account interviews. Jeff Tamarkin is the right person to be here talking with Holly and showing us an eavesdrop on their conversation. <laughs> He's a prolific music and popular cultural journalist. For 15 years, he was editor of Goldmine, a magazine for record and CD collectors, and has written the liner notes for more than 75 CDs. His book, God a Revolution, The Turbulent Flight of Jefferson Airplane, published in 2003, is still available in paperback for purchase at bookshop.org. I will post links to their books in the chat, so please watch the side panel. You may use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to post questions for Holly and Jeff. So, okay, to slightly paraphrase Janice Joplin, let's get it while we can. Please <laughs> welcome Jolly and Jeff to the Brattleboro Literary Festival. Thank you. Hi, Holly. Thank you. Well, I have a lot of questions for you, but my first one is actually kind of an obvious one, uh, but an important one. I've read, there have been so many books on Janice and I've read all of them, but I guess my question is why Janice? Um, you could have chosen so many other subjects. She's been, you know, there have been several biographies on her already. What did you think you might bring to this story going into it that perhaps nobody else did? You know, I had also read those books, Jeff, and my mm -hmm. fandom goes back to uh, my early teens, um, Pearl era, Janice, and then my years at Rolling Stone. I ran the book division there for about nine years and did quite a bit of work with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as well. So through my work, I ended up getting to read interviews with Janice, um, you know, as I said, read the other books. But the coolest thing that happened to me was I got to actually meet some of her bandmates um, from Big Brother, Full Tilt Boogie, uh, some of her other colleagues, her road manager, John Cook. And then fortunately for me, even her siblings, Michael and Laura Joplin, who are still with us, thank God. And people that knew her even back in 62, who in her very first little combo, uh, the great Powell St. John, um, I got to meet him at a conference at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. There was one in the 90s and one in 2009. And what I discovered at these panels that I was on, and my job was to kind of reflect on Janice's place in our culture today and her impact on music, et cetera, but I started learning more about her as a person and most importantly, as a musician. Mm -hmm. And I started to feel like, wait a minute, I think there's more to the story than's been told. Um, Janice had almost kind of become like this stereotypical self-destructive blues mama who was just this comet that flashed across our world with that amazing voice and that incredible stage presence. There was no question about that. But it seemed like even Janice herself almost had kind of mythologized herself as being just this kind of, it just happened just out of the blue and she just became the star overnight and then she, we lost her due to uh, demons and, uh, you know, hellhounds on her trail, et cetera, kind of that, ar you know, archival blues mama thing. And things started being revealed to me that made me believe that, wait a minute, this woman, I knew she was smart. I, you could just pick up on that from seeing interviews with her on uh, Dick Cabot's show, for example. Um, and then speaking with people that knew her, I started to think, I wanna know more about her musical journey. How did this woman get from Port Arthur, Texas, the small, very conservative oil town in the 50s, to becoming the queen of the counterculture, you know, Janice, the queen of rock, the first huge female rock star that we had. And the final uh, clincher that I had to do this book was, um, fortunately, I've gotten to write liner notes too over the years, like you, Jeff. And Sony approached me about writing some notes for a set called um, The Pearl Sessions. They had gone back into Columbia's vaults and found these recordings of Janice 
in the studio making Pearl with Paul Rothschild, her producer. Now I had done projects and other liner notes on the doors. I knew from experience and interviewing other people what a taskmaster Paul Rothschild was. He wasn't one of those producers that was open to input from the artist. I mean, he would make Jim Morrison redo a vocal like 15 times or whatever. But here he is, I'm listening to this tape and Janice is coming up with ideas. She's calling the shot. She's like, wait, wait, let's do a new guitar part here. Wait, wait, let's change the tempo. Wait, let's let's rearrange this song here. You know, she's literally doing the job of a producer in the studio. And here's Rothschild sitting there going like, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, I like that, you know. And really treating her as an equal in the studio, which believe me, at that time, Jeff, and you well know, that was just even the male artists didn't get treated that way in the studio. Um, it was a very hierarchical paternalistic system at that time. So I wanted to know how did she learn how to be so good in the studio? Um, and I then read some letters as well that she'd written home where she is geeking out, you know, with that kind of studio engineer head, writing her parents as early as, you know, 1966, telling them about what it was like to double track vocals in the studio and then what the mixing process was like on cheap thrills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I realized there's this whole techie side to Janice and this earnest um, scholar of music and also someone who was really interested in becoming the creme de la creme musician, not just someone just trying to let it all hang out, you know? And so that was my goal. And I was very inspired to get to read some of her letters where again, she would disclose things about the real Janice that I felt like had not been uh, depicted in some of the other books. The letters are so fascinating. I've read some of them before, but you used a lot more of them in your book than I've seen before. And it really is, almost like she's two different people. There's the side she presented to her family. And then there's the Janice that we knew. And you have to almost wonder which one was real or was she really, you know, quote, the combination of the two. Definitely, just like the great uh, Big Brother song that you yeah, referenced exactly. there that was used for the theme song for the Monterey Pop Festival mm -hmm. doc by D.A. Pennebaker. Well, you know, you've done so much work with the airplane and Grace Slick, who, um, uh, was one of many people who also talked about Janice's joyful side, her fun loving side, how they love to have, you know, do things together and hang out and have fun. And that was another misconception that I thought um, was maybe the case. And many of her good friends and fellow bandmates told me that a lot of the joyfulness of Janice Joplin was not really evident in the other biographies as well. And um, so that was another aspect of her I wanted to come across. Um, certainly, she was a very complicated person. And um, I wanted to focus on the music. And, you know, of course, as a biographer, you have to include uh, the aspects of someone's life, but how that affected her as a musician, etc. I could never see Grace Slick writing letters like that to her parents, though. I mean, she was more of a typical, although Grace came from wealth and she lived in Palo Alto, California growing up, which is a long way from Port Arthur, Texas. But she was more of a typical rebellious young person during the 60s who, once she left her, her home and her family, she wanted really nothing to do with them. But Janice never really left Port Arthur in a sense, did she? Yeah, she, um, she did have this really strong attachment to her family. She was the beloved oldest of three children and her parents really did nurture her artistic uh, talents. Um, as a young girl, she was very talented as a visual artist. And as soon as she showed that talent, they got her art lessons and her father started taking her to the library. Like, I think there's a great uh, quote she gave an interviewer. Um, in my family, as soon as you could you know, write your name, you got a library card. So she was an avid bookworm that she learned from her father. And then even the music, um, her mother was an excellent singer and started teaching Janice how to sing and even some rudimentary uh, piano when she was like three years old or something. So. So she had that, but of course, you know, as she went her own way, Janice discovered at age 14 on the road by Jack Kerouac, when it was published 1957, that completely changed her head around, showed her this other life that was very different from that striving, safe, um, you know, upwardly mobile uh, middle-class life that her parents, you know, were reaching for and wanted her to have as well. 
And she started seeing this other side of life. And then not soon after that, she discovered, not too long after that, she discovered lead belly and um, Odetta and she discovered Big Mama Thornton's music. Um, so again, she had a pretty soprano voice, but she suddenly realized she could do something different with that voice than what she did in church and in choir, you know, or at the glee club at school. Now, when she started going on that path, of course, that did not please her parents and they started having some friction there. And of course, uh, as she did leave home, she hitchhiked for the first time at 18. She was living out in LA with an aunt and then left and went up got a place in Venice to be a beatnik, which is what she really wanted to be. Um, she loved the beats. In fact, she always considered herself a beat, not a hippie. But she had this um, audaciousness and this fearlessness that uh, really frightened her parents. I want to read a quote from your book. It's in the introduction. And maybe you could just elaborate on it a little bit. And let me see if I could find it. You say, Janice was a walking live nerve capable of surfacing feelings that most people couldn't or wouldn't. And she was willing to endure the toll it took on her. Can you tell us a little more about what you meant there? She was a very sensitive person. Um, again, she did get a lot of love and attention as a young girl. Um, and then when that was withdrawn from her, she of course uh, alienated her parents when she wanted to be a beatnik. And then also her fellow Port Arthur um, high school students, they really just turned against her and mistreated her, bullied her really, really badly. And this was very, very painful for her. And at the same time, she was very uh, stubborn and she wasn't going to back down from what she wanted to do with her life. And um, she was willing to take the risks, no matter what the cost, to fulfill this vision of um, a well-lived life, really um, gaining experience on the road, really like that, like the book says, um, through becoming a musician, et cetera, and having all kinds of wild adventures and everything. Right. I want to ask you about the research you did for this book because it must have been a phenomenal task and difficult task. Um, when I read the book, there were many times when I felt that. I've read every Janice book, and there were many times in this book that I felt I was learning about her for the first time. Wow, thank and, you. Know, you. Even a lot of the familiar stories are told in a way that makes them feel new, and just the level of detail is so incredible. And I'm just curious how you, you know, you talked about this a little bit before, but how did you go about uncovering so much information that everybody else missed? Well, Jeff, to hear you say that, I so appreciate it because- It's hard, you, especially when half the people you'd like to talk to are dead. Well, I mean, thanks to people like you who have done a lot of research and done a lot of interviews. I mean, I basically love the research part of writing a biography. That's my very favorite part. Um, so I really try to immerse myself in that person's world. And one way to do that is by reading the interviews with her peers. and. The people in Jefferson Airplane, for example, had a huge impact on Janice. I mean, Jack Cassidy is the one that, you know, gave the song Irma Franklin's single, gave the band, you know, the single Peace My Heart, which became her first big hit when they big brotherized it, et cetera. But um, that being said, thank you so much for that compliment. And I just, um, you know, luckily due to the internet and Janice, like you said, was this incredible letter writer. Yeah. And so her family had saved everything that she had written them, all the letters home, except for some that she used to write to her dad at his office, which he destroyed, which was a big bummer. Um, but other than that, they had everything. So that was a really huge help. But then this horrible boyfriend that she had in 1965 when she was near death, when she got addicted to crystal meth, went back home to Texas from San Francisco where she'd been trying to make it as a Jew, uh, blues singer, kind of in the vein of Bessie Smith, whatever. <clears throat> she wrote him something like 70 letters. And these letters were very different from the kinds of letters that she wrote her parents, which were also amazingly descriptive letters. I mean. The, the letters she wrote to her parents when she moved to San Francisco in 66, she'd go into such great detail just describing the scene and what people were wearing. And I mean, just 
perfect documents but she was doing the same kind of letter writing to her horrible boyfriend about her new life trying to heal trying to become healthy um describing her past and bad decisions she'd made how she was she was really frightened that she did almost die in that period when she was in her early 20s um, from her drug use then um and then you know, wanting to change, um, just a lot of self-analysis, introspection, but also again, great little stories about the time she lived in Venice. So Janice really told me her story through these letters. Of course, she loved um, giving interviews. She was a journalist dream interview because she was just had the gift of gab. She came up with these great, you know, one-liners and she was just this incredibly garrulous person when it came to having discussions with interviewers. So getting to read some of those as well was really helpful. And, and luckily, thanks to YouTube, getting to see her in action, getting to um, hear some of the interviews. In fact, after the book was actually published, Jeff, you'll probably appreciate this. I stumbled on this incredible interview she did with Studs Terkel. And um, it's now you can find it on YouTube. And luckily it validated a lot of the conclusions that I had drawn based on her other things, um, some of the stories she told, et cetera. But um, just, you know, just getting to spend time with that material and interviewing everybody that I could possibly talk to who knew Janice, performed with Janice. Um, I really tried to seek out everybody you know, as usual, as you know, some people are not comfortable talking to a biographer. Um, fortunately, the family was behind the book. Uh, they shared all this material with me without giving me any restrictions on what to write. I mean, I have to have total autonomy. Um, so thank God, you know, that was cool with them. And uh, the sister, Laura, who wrote a memoir back in 91, I think it came out, had actually put some of the letters just in her book. And then she had also done a lot of interviews for her book with people who are no longer with us. And she kindly gave me her transcripts as did other journalists who had interviewed people that had passed away as well. So sort of a two part question here. What was the most surprising thing that you found out about Janice that maybe you didn't know or none of us knew? And also who are some of the people that you did speak with who are still with us that perhaps never told their stories before? Um, hmm, let's see. Well, you know, I started getting an inkling about this musicianship that she had, mm -hmm. but um, it really astounded me to find out just how good she was in the studio and um, how she really was on her way to becoming a producer. And which is a big deal, uh, even now, there's so much, uh, so many fewer women producers as there are male producers. But I think that would have been Janice's next step. Uh, I think she would have, you know, of course, continued as a singer, but I think she would have become a, a record producer. Mm -hmm. So that was a big surprise, just her technical prowess in the studio. Um, it was, what else, you know, just, a lot of other things about her as far as um, just her venturesomeness never went away. You know, in 1970 and Carnival, she went to Carnival in Rio. She was, you know, she was like the Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift of, right. of, this, of that period. And here she is hanging out in Rio. She starts hitchhiking around. She wants to check out the African culture in Bahia and Salvador and goes there. And I realized that I got really into that period and she was only there for a few weeks, but it really changed her. She loved being there. And I started noticing, you know, it affected her dancing style on stage, for example, um, things like that. So, you know, so some big things and little things. As far as the people I got to interview, oh my gosh, um, some of the people that had never given an interview um, before, to my knowledge, I tracked down this guy, Larry Hanks, who had a little um, folk group that, that performed with Janice back in 1963-64 uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, they did a lot of performances together, so he had a really good memory. I've, I've always discovered that people that haven't told the story a lot and you probably realize this too, yeah. um, you know, once they start telling the stories, they remember the stories that they've told rather than the actual orig original thing that actually happened. But he had not really been interviewed um, and, and remembered some great details about that period. Um, and then some people that had been interviewed 
actually, um, because I had re read some of the things they had said, I was able to get them to open up even further and going to a lot more detail. So um, this wonderful um, woman, Jay Whitaker, who was this uh, young African-American woman who became Janice's lover in that same period, 63, 64. Mm -hmm. And uh, they lived together for a while. So she had amazing detailed stories. Travis Rivers, who is this incredible uh, walking encyclopedia of history mm -hmm. and not only of his memories of Janice, but the history of Texas, for example, he was a Texan and he's uh, still, God, I'm so happy with us out in California. And he's the guy that literally drove Janice from Austin to uh, San Francisco in June of 66 to join Big Brother and the Holding Company. But she had first met him back in 62 when they were both students at UT in Austin. So he had just amazing uh, detailed stories um, so that's a couple of people. And then, of course, you know, the guys that have told the story before, they luckily indulged me and listened to my questions. And, um, and I think they actually brought some new fresh material to it with uh, Dave Getz and Peter Alvin from, um, you know, of course, Big Brother the Holding Company. I also, I tracked down her horn player, who sadly I have not been able to find since then, who was in the Cosmic Blues Band um, and he had never really talked before. And so he had a lot of great stories. Um, so, you know, I've tried to talk to as many different musicians that had memories. Another wonderful person, um, Brad Campbell, who was one of the few musicians that was in both the, um, the Cosmic Blues Band and then also in the Full Tilt Boogie Band. And he was just a wonderful person, uh, had, totally was so brokenhearted by Janice's uh, death that he just ended up leaving music and was a great bass player. You can see him in action and a lot of her stuff on YouTube. So he went back to Canada and just completely retired from the music business, got married, raised a family, and he was wonderful. He had a lot of uh, very vivid memories as well. So, and some of the people that I got to interview are, are no longer with us now, like John Cook, for example, has passed away and some others. Okay. We have a couple of questions from people that are watching. Um, and if anybody does want to ask questions, there's a place where you can do that on the chat. Um, this ties into what you were just talking about. And when the question basic, I'll paraphrase is when you're talking with this many people and they all have their own perspectives and their own relationships with Janice, how do you get to the truth? I, I ran into this problem myself with the airplane. Of course, I was dealing with six musicians that each had their own version of what happened back then. Of Janice not being with us, you couldn't get her perspective directly. But when you're speaking with this many people, how do you figure out which one, if any of them, are really telling you what happened? Well, that's the thing about memory, you know, and you can have four people that were in the same room at the same time, and they all four remember what happened totally differently. And in fact, a good example, um, the guys from Big Brother were interviewed for a little doc about Big Brother. Um, you know, what, what's your first memory of meeting Janice that first time when she came into seeing in their little rehearsal studio in San Francisco, each of the guys described her in totally a different outfit, you know, one with a cashmere sweater, one with like cutoffs and, um, you know, a blouse, whatever. So basically what I do is, um, you know, of course you have to look at who the person is and see if they're a credible person, number one. Number two, there's lots of different ways that you can check things out and figure out which is probably the most accurate. And just even in the case of which outfit she was wearing, you know, being from the South myself, um, I know it's blistering hot in June in, you know, Texas. So I can't imagine that she would have showed up in San Francisco with a cashmere sweater, you know, so we'll throw that one out right there. And then I'd seen lots of pictures of what Janice wore in that period um, in Texas. So, you know, you just kind of have to look at the picture. Sometimes you go online and actually literally check certain dates and see if it, everything kind of lines up. I mean, I started my career in journalism as a fact checker. Okay. at Rolling Stone back in the 80s. I was a fact checker on the first ever Rolling Stone Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll. So thank goodness that was my start because it's ingrained in my head that you have to really try to 
get the facts straight. And of course, you know, you're always going to make mistakes, you know, um, but you try as hard as you can. And then again, you just have to weigh all these different variables when it comes to conflicting stories. I probably should have asked this question first, but what is your own personal history with Janice and her music before you, long before you ever decided to write a book? When did you first hear her? What did her music say to you? And, you know, how did that lead from fan to author? Well, interestingly, she Janice hit my consciousness at about the same age that Kerouac and blues hit her consciousness, that very important age of like age 13, 14 years old. And I was uh, growing up in a small, very conservative town in North Carolina, where I felt like the outsider weirdo because I was not into the football games and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, so I think I first spotted Janice on the Dick Cavett show. I'm like, whoa, wow, <laughs> she looks awesome. I want to look like that, you know, just her whole getup with her boas in the hair and her hair out and she just kind of opened up my eyes to like this cool vibe and then of course when I got Pearl I just loved that album I mean I literally can visually see myself sitting on my shag carpeted bedroom floor with my lavender painted walls listening to that record over and over and over again I think she just um you know, the vulnerability, the hurt, the fear, the anxiety, certain things that she sang about so incredibly authentically, just really connected with me at that age. And um, of course, I just loved her voice. And then I was kind of into country rock at that point too, like uh, Flying Burrito Brothers and then the Eagles and stuff like that. So, you know, that album had kind of a countryish edge to it, you know, as compared to say, um, what she did with uh, Big Brother, for example. So that was my uh, gateway to Janice. And so that was the kind of thing that really made me very, very um, connected to her and wanting to do the book and stuff. Okay. Um, one thing you spend a lot of time with is the letters. And I'm curious, I, well, I guess I kind of asked this question before, but what did they tell you about her that maybe we wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Well, there are a lot of things. I mean, actually getting to see the physical letters and hold them in my hand. And again, just what an incredibly creative person she was. Um, they were just bursting with creativity from little drawings that she would do of outfits that she was describing, you know, going back to the clothes and stuff. She really came up with this incredible image and everything. Um, they were funny a lot of sense of humor. Um, they were very candid, very personal, um, intimate. So, I mean, I literally almost felt like she was kind of bearing her soul to me reading these letters. And she was so articulate, so smart. Um, she was just a great writer. In fact, um, you know, I got to look through her, I saw all of her report cards, the family had everything. And so, you know, her report card showed that her, she did really well in art in school and also in journalism as a student as well. So she was a very talented writer. And again, she created this persona, fun, it's all about feel, you know, she tried to show herself in a different way away from this intellectual person that she was. And so the letters really exposed the true Janice, I think. Okay, so how did she reconcile that with her public image to, you know, did her family know that there was this other side of Janice, the, the drinker, the, the wild person, or were they shielded from that? They had to have seen what we well, all saw. In the beginning, when she first went back to San Francisco, she literally told her parents she was going to Austin for the weekend when she moved to San Francisco in June of 66 to join Big Brother. And they were petrified that she was going to end up dead or, you know, whatever, like, because that did almost happen when she was in San Francisco between 63 and 65. So she did try to hide certain aspects of her um, druggy, you know, alcohol, alcohol intake. But that being said, when she first went back there in 66, she was trying to be as straight and narrow as she could, you know, she really wasn't indulging that much. I mean, it didn't take long, it maybe like a month or so, but she would kind of hide the truth from her parents early on. And 
um, also she kind of led them on that she was considering still coming back and going back to college and stuff, um, you know, try to placate their fears. But as time went on, she stopped hiding it and she would write letters about, oh my God, you know, I just got so drunk last night. It was so much fun and did it, you know, mostly talking about drinking and things like that. But then when she started getting interviewed um, by journalists, she was very open about everything from the uh, horrific racism that she had encountered growing up in Texas, um, talking about just KKK and just uh, how horrible it was that she'd seen and, you know, embarrassed her parents, I think about, um, you know, really condemning some of the people in her hometown. But then also she was, you know, kind of proselytizing kind of like Jack Kerouac did. And on the road, she kind of was doing that with her interviews about, oh yeah, you know, drinking and drugs. And it's great, you know, when she went back for the high school reunion and famously in 1970 in Port Arthur, an interviewer said, how, how are things different? She goes, oh, I can see people are taking drugs now. Yay, or something like that, you know. <laughs> So, uh, so she was pretty open about it later on. Yeah. Do you think that previous biographies of her overstated the alcohol and drug use? Is that, or is, you know, is, is that as, as important to the story? I mean, one thing I appreciated about your book is I think you really kept your eye on the prize, which is the music and put the other stuff into perspective. And some of the other books, I think, were more interested in the, uh, the dark side. Yeah, well, it's a couple of things, Jeff. I mean, one is, yeah, I think that, um, again, it, it made her become this kind of um, stereotype of this, you know, self-indulgent member of the 27 Club, that kind of thing, which is totally not the whole story. And Janice overdosed by accident. Um, she wasn't even really doing much, you know, she'd been off heroin for several months and her tolerance was down. And she ended up getting a very pure dose of heroin, China White. I think like eight people OD'd that weekend in LA and died from it or something. So it's very similar to what's happening now with uh, the fentanyl laced heroin that, you know, and, and our loss of great people like Prince and Tom Petty. I mean, unfortunately, um, drugs, drug addiction, um, alcohol addiction, it's all way too prevalent in, among artists. Um, and, you know, you can go into a whole discussion about that, but that's just one piece of the puzzle with Janice. The thing about Janice was that um, she didn't really try to hide the alcohol. She made it a big part of her kind of act, her persona. And again, you know, she was secretly needing this, you know, uh, blanket of numb, I call it, which heroin, heroin provided for her because she was such a sensitive, vulnerable person. And even though she was, you know, out there doing these incredible, outrageous, uh, courageous things, she still had all these fears and she still had the loneliness and depression. Um, so, and she used alcohol as a tonic for that. And then also, you know, heroin, sadly, too. But I, I didn't think that was the whole story. That was just part of the, you know, a story. And I thought, you know, that's a kind of a boring story. And it's mm -hmm. sadly been told way too many times. So I, I thought that the real Janice got lost in that kind of image and the way that she's, you know, horribly, um, you know, a lot of people remember her that way instead of the whole picture. So that's what I really wanted to put across. This is one of those unanswerable questions, but let's try it anyway. What would have happened to Janice if she had survived 50 years later? Would she still be making music, do you think? Well, I, I have lots of theories about that. I mean, again, I think she would have gone on to become a record producer. You know, I think she would have continued. She loved singing. She loved being on stage. Um, I think she, gaining power in the music industry, um, she would have had more control over her career, part of her issues with her health and, you know, where she was touring all the time. And so I think she would have had a little bit more of a, um, you know, balanced life. And I mean, again, she was 27 years old. So I know myself, most people, when you're in your 20s, that's your years of exploration and running around and all that stuff, at least these since that period. And I think, you know, she had never really reached that evolution as a human. She had never gotten old enough to recover from the hurts and the sadness and things that uh, the loss that she had sustained 
as a girl growing up. You know, she died just a few weeks after her 10th high school reunion. So think about it, you know, it takes a while to get over high school. So she had never really reached that point. And she, you know, as I said, she'd had some other really horrible betrayals that had really untethered her, like the guy, the con artist boyfriend who declared his love and wanted to marry her and everything. So she hadn't been able to get her security back or her confidence back in her personal life. Um, so I think it, she was you know, together enough and smart enough and lovable enough that she would have eventually been able to reach that point and had you know, a decent relationship in her personal life. But as far as music, she was taking piano lessons when she died. You know, she loved Nina Simone and actually Nina Simone, who, you know, did not love a lot of people actually, you know, gave shout outs, positive shout outs to Janice. You can hear them on some of her live recordings. Um, I think she would have ended up maybe collaborating or getting to um, hang out more with some women that she really loved, like Nina Simone, Etta James. I mean, can you imagine if they could have worked together or she could have mm -hmm. produced one of their records? I think she might have even done like a jazzy kind of piano record. She was a musical omnivore. She loved all kinds of music. So I, she loved Chris Christopherson's work. And with me and Bobby McGee, you know, becoming so huge for her, I. I foresee she could have done a whole album of like Chris Christopher, you know, Joplin sings Chris Christopherson or sings Chris Christopherson songs or whatever. She was already doing Sunday Morning Coming Down. I have a bootleg of her doing that and other great Chris Christopherson songs. So well, oh, I think is, she would still be out there, Jeff. She'd be out there performing right now. <laughs> so the book has been out for some time now. And I'm curious what kind of response you've gotten from readers, particularly younger readers who were let's say born long after Janice was yeah. done. What are, they, what are they learning about her that, you know, that, that they wouldn't have known? The power of Janice's music has only grown with time. And I mean, I've just been just gobsmacked um, by some of the responses I've gotten when I've, I got to do go out and do a lot of book touring um, when the book came out last fall up through uh, to, into February. And it was so meaningful to meet uh, younger people who, you know, had been so affected by Janice's music, not only just the quality of her voice and the sound of the music, but just uh, some of her lyrics. Um, I, you know, I teach at a university, the State University of New York, and I've had a student who uh, in one of my classes was actually could, you know, knew all the lyrics to Cosmic Blues. Mm -hmm. And she said that that she felt like that song was written for her, you know, um, you know, and it even name checks 25 years old now, you know, et cetera. That's how old the student was. And another student, oh my gosh, I mean, get your tissues out for this one. I was, I was so happy when I did an event down in Port Arthur where, you know, she had had a very difficult relationship with that town, but now 50 years later, um, it was this massive turnout for a book signing that I did with Janice's brother, Michael. And this one young woman who actually flew down, I think she was from Vermont or New Hampshire or somewhere in New England had come down for this book event. And it turns out she was, I guess, in her mid to late twenties. She had discovered Janice's music at a really difficult time in her life when her father was dying of cancer. And then she ends up getting cancer and had to have her leg amputated. And she showed me her prosthetic that had this giant portrait of Janice on her prosthetic and said that it was Janice's music that she just listened to like all the time is what got her through these really hard times. So I think, I mean, stories like that were just, you know, incredible to hear how effective Janice's musical legacy is to this day. What is, what is her legacy? Do you hear Janice? Do you hear her influence in any of today's singers or? Well, you know, influentially speaking, um, I think we could track her vocal style from Big Brother and a lot of the hard rock singers, maybe even more male than female. I think you could totally, there's a musicologist at a university in New England that did a whole like, you know, note by note comparing Robert Plant on a Led Zeppelin song with Janice, you know, at uh, I think it was 
piece of my heart or ball and chain. I think it's ball and chain, but she definitely affected people. And uh, Robert Plant himself has talked about this. Steven Tyler, Aerosmith, huge influence on him as a singer. David Johansson, New York Dolls. A lot of these guys have talked about it. Um, and then there's been some women who, again, they might not sound like Janice, who could, right? Um, she has such a distinctive, unique voice. However, the way Janice sings, the way she's able to tap into her emotion and just put it out there and connect with her audience. Um, when Stevie Nicks was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2019, she, one of the first people she thanked on stage was Janice and saying getting to open for Janice in San Francisco when she was just starting out in a band completely turned her head around and she's like, I wanna be able to connect with people the way she does. Even Alicia Keys has talked about that. So I think a lot of women from very different genres that you wouldn't really associate uh, with Janice's style per se, have been influenced by her uh, technique and her um, ability to tap in to her real emotional self when projecting her voice. Okay. Well, we have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna turn it over to you and ask you if there's anything else you'd like to tell us that we didn't cover here today. Oh gosh, well, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting that, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, Janice was a pioneer in so many ways in addition to singing the way she did and really, becoming the template for the female rock star. You know, we wouldn't have had a Madonna or Lady Gaga and all these women who took control of their career and really went out on a limb to be different and to be uh, the person that they wanted to be artistically and the fearlessness that that takes was really important. But then also so many things that we're still grappling with today, uh, issues of race in which Janice, um, really one reason she was hated by her classmates um, in Port Arthur was she stood up in favor of integrating her school um, in the 50s when segregation was the rule, even after um, the Supreme Court had broken it down, you know, and it stayed in the school system there for many years after that. Uh, gender rights, um, um, also um, sexual orientation. She was bisexual and she didn't really try to hide that most periods of her life. Um, and so all these things that are now part of our culture, Janice was you know, doing and actually pioneering in public back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. What's next for you? Do you have another bio in mind? I do, but I'm afraid to publicly, you know, <laughs> announce it right now because um, we're in the very early stages of discussion. But it was a, a if it happens as a project that kind of came out of my Janus biography. Oh, so fingers crossed. Wow, this is what this was so great. Um, wish we had more time. <laughs> There's a question there of, of somebody wanting to hear about your book too, uh, Jeff. Oh, uh, but uh, oh, um, which one? The airplane book, I suppose. Yeah, they wanted yeah. your career. Uh, it's it's almost stuff. twenty years old at this point, but um, it was you know the first comprehensive biography of the Jefferson airplane that included interviews with all the members who were all still alive at the time, and uh, sadly now we've lost uh, most of you know several of the people involved in that story. Um, three of the main band members, their manager, and other people like that. So it's. Uh, it's very different experience writing about people that were alive and contentious and in some cases didn't like each other, but you know, also were just beginning to understand their own, uh, their own place in the world and what they had, had accomplished. It's not something yeah. I want to do again, but I'm glad I yeah. did it. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, it's there. Yeah, it's still, still fun there. sometimes to those yeah. kind of problems. Um, I really enjoyed uh, reading Holly's book. I recommend it to everybody. Uh, the best thing about it is, as you read it, uh, keep your phone or iPad handy. You can uh, log on to YouTube, and mm -hmm. as uh, Holly has described, these concerts can actually see them performed by by Janice. <laughs> I had a lot of fun uh, doing that. Well, sure. thanks everybody for coming. Um, we have the next one starting at uh, three fifteen, and that uh, on this channel uh, will be female spies and their secrets with, uh, historian Lynn Olson and Arthur Megiddo. So I hope you, uh, will, uh, attend that. And, um, thank you very much, guys. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much for, for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay. We'll see you. Have a good, have a good Sunday. Thank you very much okay. everybody for tuning in.
Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you.